welcome everybody to our next gen webinar panel and speed mentoring. Um, as a lot of you know, I'm Shelby Truxton. I'm the director of membership experience here at the Nonprofit Alliance uh, and uh, also in charge of our leading edge internship program as well. Um, so I wanted to get us started um, and introduce you briefly to our speakers. You received their bios. But I just wanted to let you know who is with us today. So we do have uh, Kristen Delesk, who is with uh, Avalon Consulting. We have Bethany Riley with Further uh, Digital. And we have uh, Seiko Yoshitaki with USA for UNHCR. Tabitha Caridas with Queens Public Library Foundation. And we have Max. How do you pronounce your last name? Because I don't want to get it wrong. <laughs> no worries. Uh, Virengel. Virengel with the Denver Dumb Friends League. So welcome to our panelists. We're so glad to have you. Um, all of our panelists are what we consider young professionals. So they have between two to 10 years of work experience. And basically, they've been through what you all have been through, and they can help guide you through um, going from student to young professional. So um, just a brief announcement. Um, we're going to ask that everyone keeps their phone muted um, during the, the panel portion, of course. Um, and then you can, uh, we'll ask you at the end to unmute um, to ask any questions that you might have. If you have any questions during the panel portion, you can put those into the chat at any time, uh, and then we'll open it up for um, to read out your questions and have you um, say those out loud to our panelists and hopefully get the answers that you need. Um, so from there, let's go ahead and let's jump into our uh, our panel discussion here. So basically since we're taking you from student to young professional i do want to start with the question that i would think is on every student's mind and that's where in the world do you look for a job or internship so i know at least i know i had that question i still have that question sometimes so um so i want to start with you Kristen, um on where do you look for a job or an internship yeah so when i was in undergrad i knew that I was really interested in museums and I was hoping that I would be able to get some type of internship experience um, in museums specifically. So I knew that um, in the summers in between each year, I was going to be at home in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. So every summer I was reaching out to the museums that were in um, my town and in the close vicinity to look on their websites for internship opportunities, but then also to use my network because it is a fairly small town um, to see if I knew anybody who might know somebody who was in the museums um, and was able to get a few internship opportunities that way, just looking locally. I also senior year of college um, was able to secure an internship at a museum in the town where I went to school. Um, and that was kind of a similar experience, but I think figuring out what I wanted to do um, and then looking on websites was the kind of quickest way for me to find internships when I was an undergrad. Yeah, good advice. How about you, Max? Uh, for me personally, uh, kind of bouncing off the person said, people are probably your best resource. And it seems a little vague, but literally it can apply to someone you don't talk to very often in you know an elective you're taking or just anybody you know. Um, I find that uh, really just talking with people about their jobs and like seeing their experience, um, it helps you to figure out like what is it that you want in a job. Um, and you know it also gives you the insight of do they need a hand or may maybe they'll need help in the future. So just getting as much information as you can from as many people as you can. It's a good uh, resource, in my opinion. Very true. Uh, Tabitha, how about you? So this might seem like a cop-out answer, but I personally found that my career advisor at the university was a great first stop, and they should be your best friend in the process. They're paid to do it. They're professionals. Um, my career advisor helped me build my, career, my resume, uh, helped me with internship interview like mock interviews which was amazing 
Um, he also, after getting to know me, kind of knew where I was trying to get into, and he would send me job postings uh, related to my interests. And he even encouraged me to do an internship study abroad in Belgium, which was excellent, um, and helped me after graduation. So, you know, that is a number one resource. Um, if you're more motivated to go out and search for things yourself, there are often um, networking opportunities that are organized by your own university. You don't even necessarily have to go and seek things out. Um, so even on campus, just take a look and see see what they have going on um, in the roster over the coming months. So Wonderful. And Seko, let's jump to you. Would you say it helps or matters which industry you complete an internship? So it's focusing on an internship specifically. Does it matter what industry you completed in? I mean, I think if you're, you know exactly what you want to do, and then you'll sort of learn the the tricks of the trade, sort of the industry specific things. Um, but I think there's also just a lot of value in just seeing and witnessing how a work environment sort of um, happens, how people communicate, how things are organized, how processes are put together. Um, my first internship has nothing to do with what I do now, but it also taught me a lot around like how to manage different kinds of people or things like that. And so um, I really think any experience is really what you get it, like what you put in, what you get out of it. And so um, I think there's also sort of the opportunity to maybe you take a internship or an experience that's not exactly what you had in your career path or your five-year plan um, that actually ends up being better. I sort of fell into my career by accident and a experience came up, sort of jumped on it. And now that's where I am now. This is not sort of when I graduated college, this was not the job that I thought I would have, um, but I'm very sort of happy with where I am. And so I think just sort of um, listen to your gut, listen to intu your intuition and sort of take every experience with the value um, that you can get out of it. Definitely identify with that. Um, <laughs> how about you, Bethany? You had a, a, a good, uh, you know, story about how you started with one, one thing and then you went another direction, right? Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. So I, I actually started as a poli side major um, and I, I worked on the Hill for a little bit, realized that um, that wasn't really for, for me. Um, so it was kind of more of what I didn't want as opposed to what I did want. I'd say I completely agree that it's, um, it's more about the, um, I guess the experiences with the people that are more important than the industry itself. I think the only thing I would add is what is important is to keep the connections that you meet, even if it's like, you know, something that you don't want to pursue necessarily, I would say, my biggest learning experience was keeping up with the contacts that I had at my previous jobs. Um, Cause you never know, you know, when, when they need something, when they're going to switch, when you want to switch, I'd say like keeping those connections are the most important thing. Um, if you know, it's not what you want to do. Awesome. Great, great advice from all of you. So my next question is, um, did you look to your professors or your TAs for advice on where to apply for jobs? And so, Max, I'll start with you. Uh, sure. Uh, short answer is I did not. <laughs> um, I had a bit of a preconception, I guess it was more like a personal mental issue where I just had this preconception where I figured that uh, asking my professors and TAs for assistance was like a real chore for them. Uh, and, you know, like I, I just didn't want to bother them really. Um, but that's also an incorrect misconception or it's incorrect. Um, like they're literally paid to be there. Uh, and probably 90% of the time, the people who are in those positions, like professors in higher education, they're really passionate about, uh, you know, teaching you and, you know, helping you grow. And they're also a great resource because they have, you know, hundreds of other students who maybe graduated before you, um, who those are connections in itself uh, and pretty meaningful connections as well. Um, so definitely take advantage of those uh, because you're not a burden to them. <laughs> yeah, I think Seko, you had a similar answer um, as well. Yeah, I did. I yeah. Also, well, I had no idea what I wanted to do as I was graduating college. I was applying to jobs. I was applying to Peace Corps. I was applying to internships. I was doing all of the things because I just hadn't decided. 
Um, and so more of the conversations that I had with my professors and like um, career advisors were just on like the types of experiences. Um, for me, I uh, was studying international studies in the great landlocked state of Ohio. And so I knew sort of my opportunities were very limited within where I was. And so um, I now live in DC. And so I sort of knew that my um, sort of part of my journey out of college was moving to either a DC or a New York, a Chicago to sort of find those opportunities that um, small suburb Ohio is just not gonna get me. Um, and so I think that also made it a little bit challenging for me to sort of tap networks because I hadn't quite gotten into those quite yet. Um, and so it was just a little bit of a different experience. Um, did a lot of internet searches and sort of just got lucky. And then from there just built my network from sort of zero to, to where I am now. Awesome, awesome. How about you, Tabitha? So uh, pretty much the same as Max. Um, I really regret that's that's something that I wish I had done more was foster those relationships with my professors. I didn't really understand the value that they held until pretty much my second semester senior year. Um, but, you know, speaking from seeing how my friends have all progressed with, through connections with their professors over the years um, has you know, showed me that I should have been making more of those connections at the time. Uh, you'll also, you know, if you decide to go to grad school or even some jobs require letters of recommendation. So, you know, you need to build those connections from the get-go so that you're not reaching out to them in five years time, like, hey, you don't remember me, but I need a letter of recommendation for grad school. So really take the time. They appreciate, you know, thoughtful conversations and and just pop into office hours. They're They're there to help you. So. So true. Also a regret of mine, but <laughs> I kept in touch with one professor. I was happy about that though. So um, next question, um, actually for Kristen and Bethany, um, you know, both of you can jump in. As graduation approaches, when should you start applying to jobs? So whoever wants to start. I can go first. Um, I think if you have a clear idea of the exact industry you wanna be in or the type of job that you wanna have. You might be familiar with um, like hiring cycles if you know that there's kind of a class that comes in and joins in the spring and goes through um, kind of a similar cycle. That's something that you'll need to be mindful of. But I think if you are kind of casting a wider net as a lot of us had to do, I think starting really in the fall to look into job opportunities, start sending out applications, get your resume together. And you might find as you start to do interviews that it's really, it might be a little bit too early. They might not um, want to start hiring if you're gonna stay in the same place until after you graduate. But I think it's always good practice to go through those interview skills and to um, have those opportunities. And then you'll just, be in kind of the information gathering phase to when you hit the spring and your final semester to really start to ramp up um, all of the applications that you're sending out. Yeah, I totally agree. I would say like probably a year is when like uh, in the fall um, and then like six months before is when I would start like reaching out to people that I've connected with in the industry that I wanna work with just to kind of remind them and say like, hey, I'm graduating, you know, this coming year, and that'll give them time to um, either reach out to their network if they're not, you know, currently hiring, um, or it'll give them time at least where they know that, okay, and, you know, three to four months, we're probably going to start hiring for the busy season. Um, so I think as long as you're kind of in the game a little bit ahead of, ahead of time, that's, that's better than um, obviously waiting. Can I just jump in with something? Yeah. Um, I think those are both super, super valid points. And that was definitely me as I was approaching graduation day. But I think sort of now being on the other side of the table and sort of being on the hiring side, um, I've also seen a lot of folks sort of choose a different path of maybe they're taking the summer off to do some traveling or a different experience. And so um, I think it's sort of very, very easy to compare yourself to your other classmates, to your other friends. So-and-so got a job. So-and-so has already got their internship lined up. They know what they're doing. They're starting in June. And I think it's really important that like you get to set your own path. And so try not to sort of compare yourself where like 
in school, it's very much of like you're graded A through F and like you fail or you pass, but like in the career world, it's not that black and white. And so um, I think just sort of finding opportunities that are right for you. And um, I think if you have the, the luxury, which sometimes you may not, um, really figure out what you want. And I think uh, Bethany had mentioned even more importantly is what you don't want um, and sort of try to figure out what those experiences are. Sometimes you just have to live through them to figure out you don't want it. And that's totally fine. We've all been there. Um, but I think it's important to just have your own career path and know that it's yours and not anyone else's. I love that. Yes. Thank you for that, Seko. And we'll go into that deeper as well um, towards the end uh, about not comparing yourself because that is crucial, especially with this social media age we're in as well. <laughs> So now let's move into life as a young professional or a YP, as we call it. Um, so we defined YPs as those with 10, two to 10 years of experience, um, but some they define it by age. Um, some groups, they, they might say those who are under 35, uh, for example. Um, but basically, these are professionals who, you know, are, are, are recently started out um, in their careers um, and have a more recently been through what all of you as students are going through now. So um, so now on the young YP side of things, um, one question I have is one thing we all had to learn at this stage and continue to learn is networking. Um, so what did you learn about networking? And actually I'll start with you, Seko. Um, networking is a skill that you just sort of have to continue to learn. Um, me being on this panel is maybe not the best uh, best sort of representation, but I'm actually very much a social introvert. And so for me, networking and like walking into a room and knowing maybe one or two people is terrifying for me. Um, but sort of I've worked through um, sort of figuring out a couple of just like different tricks or things like that of like having conversations or if you're able to um, researching people before you walk into the room and like sort of figuring out like, why are you there? What are you trying to get out of it? Not sort of like, it's not exactly like tit for tat kind of thing. Um, but I think the other thing is, it's just having conversations with people. And it's a very like, once you get into an industry, like it's a small industry, it's a small world, whatever city you're in, um, you need to keep those connections. And so I think in like both keeping the connections, but also if you can remember sort of small little things about them of just like, oh, you know, their son plays soccer and like that's their thing. And then the next time you meet up with them, remembering that um, is a really, really valuable skill to have. Um, and it'll, it'll also kind of show the, the additional compassion outside of just, I'm looking for a business transaction that like we're also people and humans and we need those human interactions as well. Um, and a lot of times you'll build stronger, better connections with some of the personal pieces in addition to the professional ones as well. Love that, yes. And Max, you had a very interesting introduction to networking. Why don't you share that with us? I did. Um... Both of my parents were uh, presidents of different uh, networking groups just within uh, their respective industries. So from a very young age, you know, I'm hearing about all these events and, you know, different people who don't even work with my parents, but they know. Um, and it might seem like a little, I guess, uh, like high view. It's like, oh, okay, so I know all these people, so what? Um, but they probably stopped uh, you know, uh, being members of those organizations about a decade ago, just for a number of different reasons. But despite all that time, there are still so many connections that they pull on today. Um, just, and, and not even pull on like, oh, I need something for my business. Um, just keeping in touch. Um, I moved from North Carolina to Colorado uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, and my mother knew somebody who, uh, basically had moved out here a couple of years before I did. Um, and she was able to be like, so is he moving into an okay area? Like, you know, like just kind of, kind of to help me just get settled in a very new space. Uh, I'm an East Coaster by trade. So it's a bit of, uh, it's very, it's a little different, um, but it's, those connections are just invaluable. And I think what Seko was mentioning just, it's, I think we focus a lot on networking skills and like having to get better at networking. I think the reality is that it is just a conversation. Everybody hates networking. And so if you can make it easier and just feel like 
you know, learn about somebody like you would anyone else on the street, it does come a little easier. So I don't true. know if that answered the question, but it definitely uh, does. <laughs> <but thank you. laughs> can I can I just jump into with one um, piece sure. of advice that I got um, with networking? I totally agree that I think it's something that you have to continuously learn. One one piece of advice that I got is um, when you get someone's like business card too, when you first meet them after the end of the night, if you've collected a couple, just like write, you know, one to two sentences on the back of that business card to kind of like make sure that you remember who that person was. Cause if you go into a conference and you meet 10 people, I guarantee you in a week or two, you're not going to really remember some of those conversations. So even if it's, you know, I know, I know they do business cards now more on like QR codes and stuff, even if it's just jotting a note or two down at the end of the night, just to kind of make sure that, you know, you remember those conversations so that next time um, you can pick back up uh, was, was a good piece of advice that I got. Oh, that's great. Yes. And I, I can remember that same advice, writing it on the back of the, the card, yeah, which was great. And I know, Tabitha, you had mentioned too about networking as an introvert, as um, Seko had mentioned. Um, what, do, what would you say if you're a more introverted person, how do you go about networking? Yeah, I definitely struggled with this initially. I tried to, other than the ones at my college, I, I like kind of avoided them like a plague after college. I was like, I don't want to do this, but I think it, it, it held me back in a lot of ways. Um, one of the ways that I started going to these networking opportunities was I would go with a friend if I could, and not necessarily so that you, you know, you don't want to sit in the corner and just talk to your friend the whole night, but it was more of just, we would go together. We would challenge each other. Like, okay, each of us are going to try to get three connections tonight, you know, if even, you know, starting really low and then, and then reconvening and having that moral, moral support was really great. Um, and then trying to find, you know, young professionals groups that are, um, that are based, it's, you have similar backgrounds, similar affinities. I'm personally ethnically Greek. So I always look out for, you know, Greek young professionals groups and events, which helps, um, if you have that baseline connection, um, it, it helps for building a foundation if you, if you have that. So, um, yeah. And then also just as an aside, like, you know, one of the, one of the best places and I've found at networking events to meet people is like online for food. That is usually a really great way to strike up small talk about things outside of the industry and then bringing it back into, into professional discussion. So. So true. There's groups for everything too. So yeah, that's good advice. <laughs> awesome. So the next question is what's one thing you've done in your professional or educational life um, that has scared you the most? Um, and Bethany, I want to start with you. Um, yeah, I would say switching industries was definitely um, tough. <laughs> like I said, I was mainly in politics before, and then I made the switch to the nonprofit sector. And um, I think, like, as I've spoken with a lot of my other friends who have by now, you know, 10 years out, um, have maybe made similar kind of jumps, I feel like it's so innate for us to kind of like doubt ourselves um, and like kind of have imposter syndrome. But uh, I think some of the most like rewarding experiences that I've had have been more outside of my comfort zone. Um, cause it's, it's really like challenged me. And I, I feel like I'm someone who kind of wants to be challenged, uh, not just having a regular, you know, nine to five job that's easier. So, um, I would say like taking that kind of leap of faith, uh, and fake it till you make it, I think is the best <laughs> advice uh, that I've gotten to. Um, it's just everyone's kind of in the same boat, but uh, just be confident. So true. And yes, it can be scary, but yes, <laughs> I think we've all had to do that, make the change at some point. Um, Kristen, how about you? So I went um, straight into grad school after undergrad, and I went to um, an undergrad school where the majority of people were studying engineering and they were studying computer science and I was studying history and French. So I already felt a little bit um, kind of an outsider to what a lot of my friends were doing. And while they were all getting these big jobs and moving to San Francisco and kind of starting up their career, I had decided that I wanted to do a two years master's program. And that I felt constantly back and forth like do I want to do this do I want to delay going into the workforce for two years all these people around me are doing something really different 
Um, so it definitely was scary, but I think I gained so much from going to that program and not even necessarily through the classes that I took, but really through um, all the connections that I made. I know that's a big kind of theme of the day, it seems, but just the more people that you can meet through professors, people in my program, internships that I did. I did my grad program in Washington, D.C., which is where I still live now um, and where I was able to get all of my internships um, as well as my current role at um, Avalon. And so it definitely did pay off, but it just felt very different from kind of everybody around me and the path that people were on. And I think um, it was brought up earlier not to compare yourself to other people and to remember that you make your own path. Um, and it definitely worked out for me, but was a little tough. Yes, yes, I can identify with that too. And uh, Seko, you had a, also, um, uh, 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 was it was so, something scary as well. I think that a lot of us went through. Why don't you share yours as well? Yeah. So I think the sort of either biggest risk or scariest thing that I've done in my professional career was I was working at a startup nonprofit and I was, you know, putting in the 12 to 14 hour work days when I was done with work, I was mentally tired. Um, and I knew that I needed to make a change, but I just didn't have the actual time or the mental space to do it while working where I was working. And so, um, sort of had some conversations with some folks and it sort of just like came to me where I ended up just quitting my job without having another thing lined up, which like for me being a planner, a type A person, that kind of thing was terrifying that like, I don't know what my next income is going to be once I quit this job. Um, but for me, I just really needed that sort of mental space to be able to be like, all right, stop. What am I doing? I need to rest myself. What do I actually want my career to be? Um, Cause I was sort of on a path to burnout and I needed to sort of recognize that and sort of reconcile and course correct a little bit. And the only way for me to do that was to just quit my job, take six months, which was maybe a little bit longer than my parents were comfortable with, but um, it turned out okay. They're proud now. Uh, but I think that was something that was really scary for me that I don't think I would have sort of ever done or solved for myself. Um, I think there's also the uh mentality of like oh well how do you describe the the gap in your resume is like always like the big question right and I think um especially over the past couple of years of COVID and the conversations around mental health and sort of all of those things um I think there's more understanding to saying like I just needed a little bit of me time to figure out what I wanted um, as long as you can sort of explain that and sort of understand like how is that gap actually part of your experience and part of your journey um, to sort of where you are or where you're wanting to go to next. So, um, yeah. Yes, I identify with all of it. Scary, but we made it, right? <laughs> I know <laughs> I gave my parents it was a, a little few risky, years. but yeah. yeah. <laughs> I scared my parents a few times, but I'm 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 okay now. I made it. So <laughs> they made it too. They survived. So um we actually have about a minute before we're gonna jump into the uh speed mentoring, but um any students, do you have any questions? If you do, um, now's a good time to post it in the chat or you can hit the raise your hand button and we can unmute you. Um, we'd love to hear your questions here. Let's see, I do have one from Daniel. Let's see. And um, let me see if I can take you take you off. I'm gonna try to take you off of mute, Daniel, if you're able to talk. But Yes, hello. Uh, let me just close my door. Um, <laughs> can you guys hear me correctly? Yes, we can. Awesome. Yeah, so I'm a student at Ohio State. I don't know if this is for Ohio State student or students from all over the country. But yeah, I study in the John Glenn College, nonprofit, um, you know, public policy management, specialization in nonprofit management. I currently have an internship with the World Affairs Council of Greater Houston in the development department. And I like it very much. I think one of the questions that I do have is, you know, I think some of you mentioned a lot of my friends, my two best friends, finance, another one's a computer engineer. And, you know, there's, there's that kind of like uh, thought in my mind about kind of like salary, especially if I think about like uh, post-graduation. So I was just wondering if you guys ever had like those, um, not fears, but those like thoughts and just reflecting on 
kind of like those stereotypes about the nonprofit sector compared to, I guess, the private sector or engineering or what any of those fields? Good question. Anyone want to jump in on that? I can start us off. Um, first with the OH, we love Ohio. Um, that's where I'm from. I <laughs> love it. Um, so for me, um, I started a nonprofit and I think the first couple of jobs sort of that I had right out of the gate were on the lower end of low pay. Um, but I think there are nonprofits that really will value personnel and value the people. Um, and so it's sort of just trying to find those. Like if I'm being very, very frank and honest with you, um, I'm currently working for the UN Refugee Agency. Before that, I was at a for-profit agency. I am making more now at my nonprofit because of the value that I was able to say that I provide to them than my salary at the agency. And so I think it just really depends um, on the organization that you're looking for, on their budgets, on those kinds of things. And so I think if there is sort of the, the salary fear or hesitations, particularly in the nonprofit space, I would say the number one thing is do your research. Um, one of the things that I always do before I look for a job or what organization that I want to work for, particularly if it's a nonprofit, is looking at their financials, their 990s, their financial statements, their annual statements, and all of those things like that, just to get an understanding of what their budget is. Um, but I think there's also a little bit of um, what doesn't go into a monetary salary that you can get out of a job. Um, and so I think that also plays into the equation. Maybe not the best place to start off your career where you're needing a little more income, um, but I think at some point you'll wanna sort of balance out that like the monetary value of the job versus like the mental health, the sort of um, productivity, the joy that you get out of your job and sort of weighing the two. Great. Yeah. I'll jump in and, and say that uh, before I started working at the Queens Public Library Foundation, I was working at a prestigious corporate law firm in uh, Midtown in New York. And I, I took a pretty significant pay cut um, when I joined the foundation, but I've found so much value in what I'm doing um, and, and in my work that it it far outweighs the monetary, you know, the prestigious, you know, fancy corporate lunches and all of that. It, it didn't make matter in the long run, so. Um, just to jump into a little bit, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm more on the agency side, so I think, you know, Max, Tabitha, and Seko can probably speak a little bit more to, like, the actual um, nonprofit side, but I agree that I think looking at some of it holistically and kind of finding what that balance is, like, I know a lot of nonprofits um, that we work with, um, they have, you know, really flexible, like, working schedules, which means, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to commute, you can work remotely, um, which could factor into finances as well if you don't have to pay for a car to go to work. Um, so taking it taking it like that, not just at the base pay, but you know, 401k matches, um, benefits like that. I'm also um, on the agency side, but Avalon only works with nonprofit clients. And that's something that I didn't even realize when I was in grad school and when I was looking for jobs that there would be an opportunity for me to work um, technically in the private sector, but to support all of these different nonprofits and all of these missions that I really care about to be able to kind of get that balance that everybody has mentioned between the work that you're doing, but not, um, you know, totally running yourself into the ground with crazy hours or anything like that. Thank you.